Hello, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener, the show where you ask the questions and our great panel gives the answers. I'm Shane Coulter. I'm filling in for Diane Nolan, who would have to use sign language if she were here today because she's not <laughs> feeling very well. But I'm going to try and take her place the best I can. But she's left me with a fantastic panel, all ladies this evening. This is the first time. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And I'm going to go ahead and start with Jennifer. Jennifer, you introduce yourself. And I'm Jennifer Fishburne. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension over in the Springfield area. Um, and I like to talk about vegetables and herbs. Um, and tonight my question is neither one of those. <laughs> um, I, we have a viewer's question. It's on hydrangea. There are glowing embers. Hydrangea is planted in a protected sunny spot, um, but hasn't bloomed for two years and they wanna know why. Um, glowing embers is a, a big leaf um, hydrangea and in that grouping um, they flower on usually the old wood so you need to make sure that's protected through the winter and the problem is a lot of times the flower buds um, get nipped and are really really cold um, and uneven winter temperatures so a suggestion would be to put mulch or a compost around that up to about six inches deep for some winter protection to help protect the lower part which may not always help the flower buds but it, it should help um, in that case yeah, that's, if we were going to have a top 10 questions that were answered over, that's probably number one. We answered probably every other show. But uh, it's a great looking hydrangea. It just it gets knocked back so hard. So that's why the newer varieties are, are much more popular because of that. All right, well, we're going to go to Candace and you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Candace Miller. I'm also a, a U of I horticulture educator, but I work in the northwestern corner of the state. I have six counties that I work in up there. Uh, and I thought it would be good today to bring some different bulbs as we're moving into the holiday season. It's a, a popular gift to uh, force bulbs, give those as a gift, or even just have them as a home decoration. So if you go to the garden center, you'll see uh, now there's a lot of a couple different types of bulbs available. You can get paper whites, which is a type of daffodil. Um, you can get amaryllis. Obviously, that's a very popular holiday uh, bulb to force. Or you can also get some of the other common spring bulbs like hyacinth uh, available. And the key there is that they've been pre-cooled. The nice thing about the paper whites or the amaryllis is that they don't need a cold treatment uh, to flower. So you can just buy your bulbs, put it into a, a container like this where the bottom of the roots is just in water or even just a shallow disc with stones, put it right in there. It doesn't necessarily have to have soil. You just need some water. Uh, for the roots. So very easy to do and you get some nice nice flowers from it within a couple of weeks So it makes a great gift or just decoration for the home. Yeah, and they're nice And, and a lot of the bulbs are on sale during yeah. this time of year because mm -hmm. it's getting towards the end of the planting outdoor season So yep. you get some good deals on things in your home. Can. All right, we're gonna last but not least go to Rhonda Great. I'm Rhonda Free. I'm also with the University of Illinois Extension I'm also a horticulture educator and I'm right in the middle of the state. I cover Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell. And I usually cover questions around landscape horticulture, especially I like weeds, which is a little odd sometimes. <laughs> but my show and pet tale today are the holiday cactus. And so I brought the two different kinds that I have at home and most people have. And so on the left here is uh, actually a Thanksgiving cactus. And on the right is a, uh, on my right is a uh, Christmas cactus. Uh, the difference between those two is the Thanksgiving cactus has uh, pointy edges on the leaves and the ca uh, Christmas cactus has more scalloped or rounded edges on the leaves. And usually most people have the Thanksgiving cactus. You may be having those uh, bloom right now. And uh, that is because they really uh, uh, bloom pretty easily. They don't, they're not as finicky with the cold treatment that's required for those. Uh, the Christmas cactus is a little harder to get to bloom. Uh, my uh, Christmas cactus is funny, but it usually blooms in June, actually. <laughs> uh, so those are the differences between those two holiday cactus. And that's a, a real timely uh, show and tell because last week we had somebody call in and said they couldn't get the Christmas cactus mm -hmm. to bloom. It always bloomed at Thanksgiving. And I don't think most people know that there is a Thanksgiving cactus. Yeah, they just yeah. assume everything's a Christmas cactus. So. Right. Very timely. Well, speaking of last week, last week uh, we had a question about a white pine, and it was covered in a white, it looked like flower, and we didn't really have the answer on the show, but 
there was somebody watching that knew the answer, and because he knows the answers to all the questions about bug, it was Jim Appleby. So Jim obviously uh, had to chime in on it, and he sent us an email to say what it was. And the question at the time was, again, a white pine covered, like the picture there, in little spots. And uh, Jim said that it is a aldigid, which is a, uh, of a, the official name is a pine bark aldigid, uh, Adel, Adelgid? Adel? Adelgid. 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 I knew I was going to mess that one up. <laughs> but it, it's cured like a lot of other bugs in the fact you use a horticultural oil spray, and he recommends that you do it during late March or April when the temperature's in the 50s or 60s, and you uh, apply it to the branches and needles um, that have the lighter infestation, and uh, use a single spray with good coverage should be sufficient. Um, very susceptible to this disease, and... Uh, no, actually, it says uh, some white pines appear very susceptible, but most are resistant. So it's not a huge problem, but it does happen. Uh, horticultural oil will get rid of it, but if you don't control it, it could be a major problem on your white pine. So as always, uh, Jim is a panelist and a big fan of the show as well. So now we're going to go to uh, Did You Know video. 20 species of mistletoe are endangered, so it is carefully harvested from the forest for your use at your next holiday party. All right, well, now's the time where we answer some phone calls, and we're going to go straight to line one, Kathy. Kathy, do you have a question for us? Yes, I do. Um, I bought some teeny tiny little boxwoods, and now they are about four and a half feet tall. Um, and I don't want them that tall. How how um, how short can I can I take them down um, without hurting them? Because I know I'm, they're going to be pretty woody on the inside. So I'd appreciate an answer. Thanks. Well. The Go ahead. Go, go ahead. <laughs> the answer is going to be not very much. Um, boxwoods are an evergreen that doesn't recover well if you cut it back into the what with the area where you're not having any green anymore. Right now would be a good time to do that though because you could use that boxwood foliage in some um, Christmas decorations. Um, but you do want to be careful to not go back too far um, and leave some of that green exposed. Yeah, and I was going to say the the usual rules don't cut more than about a third off of of most anything, but Definitely don't go farther back than the green because it's not going to uh, leaf out well from that. Yeah, bo boxwoods and yews are the two mm -hmm. plants you just don't go back very hard. And uh, they don't grow real fast. So you, the, I would, in the future, look for that time. You know, they grow so slow, you probably had three or four or five years to get that trimmed. So stay on top of those because are, they are easy to keep small. But once they've gotten big, it's not going to come back to. But you could get a nice wreath out of it, it sounds like. Right. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, we're going to go to line two. Fred. Fred had some questions about pear trees. Yes, uh, I have a couple of grandkids that really like to eat pears, so I thought I'd kind of plant a pear tree in the spring for them. And uh, years ago, we had a, a kefir pear tree on the farm, and um, it was all by itself, and it produced plenty of pears. But I'm, I've been getting some conflicting information. And um, I didn't particularly want another kefir because they were kind of grainy. And um, I'd, I'd like to move to a different uh, pear tree, but the, the kefir uh, seemed to uh, pollinate itself very, very well. And then I read where even apple trees will cross-pollinate with, uh, with a pear tree because supposedly they're the same family. But I also understand there's a blight in the area, some kind of a red blight that, that uh, is hard on pear trees. If you guys could help me out with picking out a good... Uh, species of pear tree, I would really appreciate that. Anybody? Uh, I can speak to that last question about the, the blight. Fire blight is uh, very common on pear trees as well as, as apple. It, it affects uh, trees in that same family. So uh, that is something to think about is that when you are choosing that variety, you want to look for resistance and see if you can get some fire blight resistance to the variety you choose. Uh, and in terms of varieties, uh, I would recommend you check our extension website. We usually have a, a nice list for each type of pear tree of uh, some recommended varieties for Illinois and then kind of the features of, of each of those. Uh, beyond that, looking at, looking at your catalogs and seeing uh, if it's going to, like you said, if it needs a cross-pollinator, it's going to be able to offer which ones work well together. And I would just add to that, um, there is a 
really nice uh, fruit just fruit grower on the other side of Illinois in Missouri. Um, so you might look at them, but there's a you know you ask around, ask other people what they what they where they've gotten their plant material because your your what where you get the plant material is going to be really important. Um, most of the reputable companies are only going to sell what's going to do well in in this area. So pay attention to that. And I, and I can speak as a retailer, I, I never know what people like, because everything I bring in, this guy <laughs> likes this one, and this girl likes this one, uh, but, but that's where the internet's a fantastic place. There's lots of forums, and everybody has their opinion on what's the best, and, and there's tons of information on fruit trees, but I find I'm always lacking compared to people that shop, because it, it, everybody has their own opinion on what's flavorful and what's the best, and it's never the same. Pears, I'm not real familiar with them, better with apples and other yeah. ones. But I'm sure there's plenty of people that will chime in with their favorite fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately, I hate to send people to the internet, but that's a good one when it comes to fruiting. So thanks for the question. We're going to go to another call. We're going to go to line four, Jim with an orange tree question. Yes, I have a question about an orange tree. We have an orange tree that was started from a seed from a Florida orange about 35 years ago. And we keep it in a big pot, and we put it out in the spring and bring it in in the fall, and we keep it trimmed up. It's about five feet tall and very stocky. But this summer, to our surprise, we discovered four oranges growing on it, and we don't know why after all these years that happened. Can anybody explain that to me? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. Uh, you, uh, Florida Extension might be a place <laughs> to go to, uh, but I would guess that you know orange trees are going to take a while, just like any of your other fruit trees. They take yeah. a while to bear. Or they have to get of a decent size in order to do that. But um, yeah, I think you're maturity. lucky. I think I you're lucky to maturity, get too. to get any any. I um, mean, you must be must have a wonderful greenhouse or area in your home to keep that because mm -hmm. you need a you know they need a lot of sun all year long. Mm -hmm. It's it's really time. We have a greenhouse where we store plants over the winter at our nursery, and we've got some lime and lemon trees that have 40 limes and lemons on them, oh, nice. and and a lot of them are grown from seed. Some of them will have thorns if you grow straight from seed. Uh, the the fruit trees don't turn out like you think they are. But they absolutely, and a banana tree too, a banana, I can't remember the exact number, but it's like 35 or 40 leaves, and then the fruiting kind will start to fruit. So I think you just kept it alive long enough to start seeing some results. And just keep doing that, bring it out in the summer and bring it in. Uh, again, we get to enjoy all the fruit because they tend to fruit more during this time of year for us, and, and when we store people, they leave for Florida, and it's funny, mm -hmm. they leave their fruits here and then go to Florida for more fruits. <laughs> we get to enjoy them all. So yeah, yeah, I think he's just lucky. I think there's a lot of future in oranges for him, so. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of fruit, or not a lot of orange juice, so from a plant that day usually yeah. more. All right, before we go to the next round of questions, we're gonna go through one more round of uh, questions and answers, maybe a little show and tell. And we'll go back to you, Jennifer. Okay, um, what I brought just happens to go along with a question that I received. And um, what I have is a hydrangea blossom. And what I just wanna point out here is that a lot of times around this time of year, we'll get questions as far as, do I prune my shrubs back now? Do I prune my uh, perennials back now? Or do I leave those for, for in the winter? Um, and the answer is yes. <laughs> um, it really depends on if you had any disease problems or not. If you had disease problems, you probably wanna prune things out. But what I point out here is this is great winter interest for the garden. So, so leaving some of those ornamental grasses, hydrangeas, things that have, um, fruits that are going to stay persist, or excuse me, flowers that are going to stay persistent on the plants um, can really provide some nice winter interest for you. So. Yeah, they do a good job of catching leaves and things to help protect them over the winter too. That's the other thing is, uh, you know, a lot of people cut their grasses back, but we get a hard winter and no snow and it can cause a lot of damage, but the beauty's really nice. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Candace, do you have a question okay. for us as yeah, well? Yeah, I had a, a question come in about forsythia. Um, they were saying after this glorious winter we had, their plants are lush and beautiful, uh, but it's huge and there's no yellow flowers that they had this year, so they're wondering why. And the reason for that is because of that glorious winter. Uh, the flower buds of Forsyth, they're actually only hardy to about negative five to negative 15, and we, we did have some pretty, pretty cold times this past winter, so more than likely those flower buds got killed off. The leaf buds are a little bit hardier, so you still got foliage that came out, uh, but you just didn't have any flowers that came out. So nothing wrong with your plant. It's, it's just that season we had. Um, if you did have some flowers, they probably would have been below the snow level because the snow provides a little bit of protection. So that kind of looks funny when you have the, the bottom plant flowering and the top not. Uh, you could think about, there are some kind of slightly hardier varieties, a uh, meadow lark and northern sun. I believe we're uh, bred in Minnesota, so they have quite a bit more 
uh, hardiness, their buds can actually go down to negative 30. So if you really want that consistent flowering, you might think about um, some of those varieties. Yeah, there, that was one thing missing. Was, you know, we're so busy coming out of winter, we, we just shell-shocked and we kind of forgot the, that mm -hmm. they didn't bloom this year. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't happen again this winter, although it doesn't, it's not a great start so far. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, Rhonda, you've got a, uh, you got a question as well? Yeah, the email question that I have is on an asparagus fern. It asks, when is the best time to repot or trim an asparagus fern? And secondly, is it necessary to cut back both the top and the root ball when doing this? And I believe the picture that you're seeing on the screen is the foxtail fern. Uh, it is also called the Myers fern. It's a little bit more tightly uh, in, the, uh, in the needles. Most of us usually have the more loose needled fronded fern, uh, asparagus fern. Uh, a lot of times people take those outside in the summer or they'll use them in outdoor containers and then they'll bring them back in in the winter. And I think that's an excellent time to do the cutting back. And actually they can take, I've completely cut my asparagus fern back before uh, and then just had, let it re-sprout. Uh, you could also divide it and, and cut it back. So really they're pretty resilient. They can take quite a bit and uh, just do whatever is going to work best for your situation. All right. Well. We are going to get back to the phones, and Rick, you've been very patient. You had a question about, what do you know, Christmas cactus? Christmas cactus. Um, yes, I had a Christmas cactus, and um, it had white fuzz on it for some reason. I couldn't figure out what it did. I had it for about two months, and it had white fuzz on it, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And it ended up dying about a month later after I started realizing it. I just wondered if you guys knew what that was. Yeah, it sounds like it had mealybugs, uh, which are a common indoor insect that will uh, happen. Uh, they have kind of that white, uh, just like you said, cottony growth that's on top of the little insect that's underneath. And it's real sticky, it's really hard to get rid of. So, you know, honestly, a lot of people just end up throwing that plant away. Uh, some people uh, might try an indoor labeled insecticidal soap or, you know, maybe some alco alcohol swabs or something, but uh, they're really hard to get rid of. Yeah, sometimes it's easier okay. just to toss it and yeah. start over. It's yeah. the worst bug in all our greenhouse. It'll it'll go in the cracks of the wood, and even when you put it in a cold greenhouse at negative 20, it'll hide in the cracks and mm -hmm. be alive. It's mm -hmm. it's our worst bug by far. We, we throw everything away that gets yeah. it. So mm -hmm. Christmas cactus at the price that they grow them, it's probably worth throwing yeah. away and starting yeah, that's over. True. Okay, we're going to go to another question. Bob, line six, Bob has a fruit tree question for us. Uh, yes. Um, I'm wondering whether or not on your fruit trees, apple uh, and peach trees, can they be pruned um, in the winter months or should you wait till springtime anyway, before, you know, early spring? Either, either way, the key, the key with uh, fruit tree is fruit tree pruning as long as it's the dormant season. So uh, whenever the leaves have fallen, you can, you can do that pruning. For one thing, you can see the framework of the tree a lot easier. Uh, so that's one great benefit, but you're also not going to spread any diseases uh, typically during the dormant season. So whether you do it now or if you do it closer to, uh, to spring, I think either one's okay. As long as you get it done before uh, that new growth starts to come out in the spring. Yeah, when the sap's not pumping is what yeah. we kind of say. Yeah, we do it now or March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually, and usually it's now a great temperature to do it, but it's been miserable out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for trimming. But it's, yeah, it's a good time to do it. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to another question. We've got line one. Mark has a pumpkin question. Mark, you there? Yes. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, um, I planted about a 20 by 20 pumpkin patch. And I had a lot of blooms, and, you know, it, it looked like it was doing great. Now, one thing that did happen, uh, there's like a white dusting on the, uh, on the leaves, but, um, but um, uh, I didn't end up with any pumpkins, not even a one. Want to take that one? Well, I was going to say, the white stuff's powdery mildew, um, which is a common f fungus that gets onto squash and pumpkins, and the way to treat that would be to use a fungicide. Uh, but why you didn't get any... It sounds like a um, pollination yeah. issue. Yeah. Did you have plenty of blooms? Yes. Is it possible? I also have a lot of squirrels. I was just curious if they might have had a... That's a little bandits might have had something to do with that. Very, uh, probably doubtful. I mean, you should have at mm -hmm. least seen some small fruits, but I think Rhonda kind of answered it best, and it probably is a pollination issue. Um, 
hopefully you weren't spraying any insecticides early on that might have um, uh, prevented them from being in your garden or um, being taken out of your garden mm -hmm. by insecticides. So be real cautious of that early on when they're flowering. But that would be about the only yeah. reason Unless they the shouldn't have. powdery mildew was severe enough, but if the plant still lived, you should have still had mm -hmm. red fruits on it, yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, there's not, not great answers to that, but, but yeah, and the, and the flower buds are very tasty, but usually that's more deer and larger animals, not squirrels so much. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry, couldn't be a little bit more help, but hopefully this year he'll have a little better chance. We're going to go to line three. Tom has a question for us. Hello. Hi, Tom. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, I got a question for you. Um, I bought this year from the nursery, I bought a giant crimson and a Alice DuPont. Unfortunately, nobody won them because these things grow like six and a half or seven foot tall, and they have like hundreds and hundreds of beautiful, beautiful blooms. What do I do as far as for the winter time? I can't find nothing on my resources uh, on the internet in reference to mm -hmm. uh, what do I do for the winter time as far as for pruning back or leaving them there or whatever. I think that's Mandevilla. If I, I were, say, I were they uh, kind of a climbing vine with lots of flowers yeah. all over them? Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, well, they're not hardy here. If you're calling from Illinois, if you're calling from Florida, you're going to be just fine. But <laughs> if you're calling to Illinois, you're going to have to overwinter them in the house or a greenhouse and keep them in the, at least the 50s uh, and hold them inside. So outside won't work very well. Um, they never look real good during the winter because they are a high light need. They will bloom, but they just kind of turn yellow and look ratty, but if you can keep them alive going into the spring, then you can bring them back out, just kind of like our fruit tree earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and get them refreshed, get them fertilized, and make them look all good from April all the way till now. Well, it looks like you got cut off, but that's, yeah, I, I only know the Alice DuPont. I think that's one we've carried before. Yeah, I haven't heard of giant crimson. Yeah. I thought he had azaleas at first or something. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of great plants here that we just can't grow over the winter, so you got to bring them inside. All right, we're going to go to another phone call. We're going to go to Carrie on line two. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, in watching your program and other similar programs, I understand that planting and transplanting trees and shrubs, you should not cover them above the root crown. My question is, in, uh, in putting mulch around them, I've, many of my neighbors will put mulch 6, 8, 10, 12 inches deep <laughs> around their shrubs and trees and is that doing the same thing as uh, covering the root crown because they do put it right up to the trunk of the tree. Yeah, it sounds like you uh, have your own answer there. We usually say that our mulches have to be two to four inches thick, uh, not anymore, and we don't like those big volcano mulches mm -hmm. up on the tree. So you're right, have two to four inches of mulch and then pull it away from the trunk of the tree just a little bit. Uh, and that's going to give you some weed control and some better uh, temperature, um, you know, in the soil, uh, help to hold the water a little bit better. Uh, but two, more than uh, two to four is really uh, no, not good. Yeah, not needed. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem. And, and even, you know, even a company like ours, it, it's, you struggle with it because people want you to remulch, but they don't want to pay to have any mulch taken away. Mm -hmm. So it becomes that <laughs> volcano and it becomes mm -hmm. it stacking and, and this, it doesn't quite break down as fast as you remulch. But on plants and perennials, he was asking about shrubs and, and perennials. They're, they're not quite as hard as trees as far as mm -hmm. getting a little too high. Th their roots yeah. tend to come up and treat it like soil. So it doesn't choke them out like a tree would. Yeah. So it's, it's not quite as bad, but it's definitely an issue. This lasagna mulching <laughs> where it gets six and eight inches of mulch is definitely an issue. And I'd really recommend that you make sure that you're putting that mulch at least out to the drip line of the tree. If you can go further than that, that's even great. It keeps, like Rhonda said, the, the soil more consistent temperatures, holds that moisture in, keeps other plant material from competing um, with the tree roots, which mm -hmm. is important. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're gonna try and get one more question in. Uh, we're gonna uh, go to line four, Alice. Alice, you got a minute for a question. Hi, quick question. Uh, last week you talked about this wilt proof, waterproofing to help uh, de desiccation on especially evergreens. My question is, I have brought in my bonsai, a white cloud juniper, and some and pine bonsais. Could I use those inside so I don't have to spray my, um, you know, mist them every day, twice a day? 
It, that wouldn't work quite as well for that that scenario. There's a lot of good uses for wilt proof, and I would say we found one that's not. Um, <laughs> bringing bonsai inside during the winter and the evergreen is really tough. It, it's I don't know if you've ever had experience with it, but I've tried. It never ends well. Yeah, <laughs> I always start with the precumbens juniper because it's the cheapest of uh -huh. the juniper. So. Uh, I don't think that wilt proof would be a good idea, yeah. especially if you got all that time invested in your bonsai. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you'd have to go more to like a rock pan or something underneath to try and, you know, try and keep the water keep the humidity, mm -hmm. humidity level mm -hmm. up a little mm -hmm. bit more. Is, is that all the only kind you have or, or evergreens? Uh, yeah, I've been bringing them in for 10 years, but I'm very faithful about um, uh, spray misting. I'd say if you've had them for 10 years, keep doing what you're yeah. doing. Uh, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, you, you should be teaching us after 10 years, not asking about. So you don't really need to have any steps to save you. So I think you're pretty good. Well, thank you for everybody that called in today. Thank you, everybody. It's my first all-woman panel, so it's been a pleasure. Hopefully everybody will con continue to see us next time. Have a nice day.